would you ever have foreseen yourself doing that? When you, before you were ever, uh, or maybe when you just said, okay, we're going to be in the USO and we're going to go to Vietnam, would you, did you have any idea that it would lead to what it led to? No, um, not at all. It totally altered our lives because um, I, I probably would have been teaching um, college uh, choral groups because uh, my major was choral education at Chicago Music College of Roosevelt University. So I would have just kept you know, plodding forward in there, in that direction. But by going to Vietnam, it gave us a, a real taste of uh, the Orient and the world. And we had a passion for exploring the world and, and the Orient and, and, and going back. So, uh, so we, uh, it did, yes. This, this experience in Vietnam totally changed our lives led you to be sort of fearless and intrepid travelers, didn't it? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Oh, and I, I spent, by the way, uh, we actually were quite accomplished in, in uh, Hollywood. Jenny uh, was a member of the Emmys, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, in the music division. Uh, and she wrote music. She wrote music theme songs for ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. And she was also on the board of directors of Women in Music, and um, she belonged to the Grammys. And then I uh, we actually uh, wrote and produced, uh, I wrote, actually co wrote a couple of movies. We wrote a movie together, um, and I produced some uh, television, and I joined the Producers Guild of America, ended up being on the board of directors of it. Um, and together, we wrote a New York Times best-selling book. And it's called, You'll Never Make Love in This Town Again. <laughs> now, if you write a book and it sells 60,000 copies, you will get on the New York Times bestseller list. This book sold 450,000 copies. It was in five hardcover printings, two softcover printings, and an audio tape. And it's a very interesting story about what happened uh, with this book. Um, I don't know if I can tell it or not. I mean, it's up to you. Oh, okay, it's a great story. It's a great story. Um, I was working at a, a place called Love Books in uh, Beverly Hills. And I was working on a, a book, compiling a book called Tales from the Casting Couch. And while I was compiling it, I got a call from the publisher, um, Michael. I'll say Michael, although he has since passed away. And um, he said, uh, I'm calling from the plane. I'm with a lady. Her name is Faye Resnick. And we are going to do a book about O.J. Simpson. And uh, because O.J. Simpson was uh, in jail and he was about to be tried uh, for the murder of Ron Goldman. And will you be our point man? Because I'm taking her to our estate in Stowe, Vermont. At the time, he was married to a wonderful actress. And uh, anyway, uh, Mike Walker of the National Enquirer was writing the book with Faye Resnick in Stowe, Vermont. And I was the point man. And uh, one thing led to another, and they flew me out to Stowe, Vermont. I ended up being a ghostwriter, along with another man. I don't know if he wants me to say it. Uh, I will. His name is Les Whitton. The book um, was called Nicole Brown Simpson, Private Diary of a Life Interrupted by Faye Resnick. And it sold over a million copies. It stopped the O.J. Simpson trial. And O.J. was calling collect from jail because he thought that Faye Resnick would be testifying for him. Anyway, uh, so uh, the publisher said, well, I'm not going to give you credit for writing this book, but I'm going to give you another book to write. And uh, it's about three women in Hollywood and their experiences with, uh, with, with men. Uh, so it turned out to be five women, four women. And uh, I said, can I, my sister write it with me? Yes, you can. So we wrote this book. And um, when we finished writing it, we kept asking for a contract. Can we have a contract? Can we have a contract? And um, uh, he wouldn't give us a contract because he said uh, that, uh, that Gloria Steinem would be writing it with us. Well, it turns out she didn't write it with us. She wrote a cover blurb. Um, so then the book came out. Oh, no, excuse me. Um, when we turned the book over, he stopped returning our calls. And a friend of ours, Sam Trust, said, Rum, don't walk to the copyright office and copyright your book. 
So we did. We got a call from the attorney from the publishing office, and he said, you know, um, Michael doesn't like what you wrote. He's doing a page one rewrite. Turn over all of your tapes, all of your interviews, all of your work in progress. Well, we made copies, and we turned over copies. We get the original. So then we got a call from the attorney. He said, well, even though you didn't write the book, uh, you're going to get your names on page three. So we did. This is the, uh, the New York Times bestseller list and the Los Angeles Times bestseller list. Uh, so he put our names on page three. Well, the book came out. It shot to number one in L.A., and we got an audio tape, and Jenny was listening to the audio tape in her car, and she pulled over, and she called me, and she said, you know, this is our book exactly. So we didn't think anything of it, and a friend of Jenny's um, by the name of Charles Renbar, he's a copyright attorney in, in New York, he has since passed away, he said, gee, he called, said, I see your name on the New York Times bestseller list, can I ask you what your deal was? And he, we said, well, it's embarrassing, but we didn't have a deal. He said, really? Well, did you get your book copyrighted? And we said, well, yes, we did. He said, well, go home and compare your copywritten manuscript with the book. And we did. And it was 98% all of our rating. The editor had done a lot of cutting and pasting. So uh, he said, well, let me ask you some questions. Um, where did you sign a work for hire? We said, no. Did you work at home? Yes. Uh, did you work on your own computer? Yes, we did. Um, did he pay you? No, he didn't pay us to write this book. He said, well, do you realize that you own 100% of the profits of this book? He said, I can't handle it because I, I'm in New York, but you will get an attorney to, uh, to represent you uh, on a contingency fee in L.A which we did. Long story, that attorney didn't work out, got another attorney, and who was fabulous. Uh, his name was uh, Glenn, um, oh, anyway, can't remember, but he was a wonderful attorney and a, and a girl attorney. And um, when, when we brought the lawsuit, uh, the publisher, his defense, was that he had written the book with his mother and that we had just typed it which was kind of silly because he didn't realize we had all of the original tapes and work in progress. So we had thousands of bait stamp pages of, uh, of work in progress on this book, and he had nothing. Uh, so uh, we ended up um, going to federal court. We chose a jury, and the night we chose the jury, the insurance company, AIG Insurance, uh, came through with a great settlement offer. And I didn't want to accept the settlement because I wanted to prove that we wrote this book. And our attorney said, you know, you don't know what you're doing. The worst thing that can happen is that you win the case and then it's in appeals for the next several years. Take the money. So thank God we took the money. And uh, I'm real happy. And that was Jenny. Jenny actually talked me into it and the, it was the best decision we ever could have made because that led to us, um, me, buying a condominium in Scottsdale and ending up uh, living up here in, in the most beautiful place in the universe, Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> now, you know that I have to ask you, having seen the title of this book, if it is in any way autobiographical. Not, not, <laughs> no. Actually, well, well, what happened is we wrote it, First Person Diary, and we interviewed all these women. They were lovely women. Uh, three of them actually were uh, ladies of the night, let's say. Oh. I actually, and two of them were Heidi Flights hookers. And so when we interviewed them, it was our idea for to write it first-person diary as if they wrote it. So that's why it says, by Robin, by Robin, Lisa, Linda, and Tiffany. Um, and then uh, that's for printings one and two. So for printings three, four, and five, the publisher thought, hmm, I'm not going to pay, I'm not paying, hadn't paid uh, us to write it. So he was setting up the editor to write the sequel. Uh, so he put, by Robin Lysa and Tiffany, by the editor's name to set it up for her to write the sequel, which she did, and it didn't sell hardly anything. Uh, <laughs> 
that's that, that's her story. It was sort of poetic justice, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was poetic <laughs> justice for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else that you that you want to talk about? You you've had a very interesting life up to now, and probably going to be interesting from here on out too. Um, is there anything that we skipped over that that you want to add? Um, let's see. Um, I would like to say that I so appreciate all of the wonderful servicemen who serve our country. I mean, when when we were in Vietnam, we would go to hospitals and we'd see these you know wonderful soldiers who had just I mean put their lives on the line and and were injured and, and recovering. And even today, there are so many people from Vietnam and, and all of these wars who are still in hospitals, who are still recovering, who are still having effects of Agent Orange and all of the things that they were subjected to for the love of their country. And, and I know that we have an enormous respect for them. I just want to show you actually something else. When we were um, uh, for years, Jenny and I, when Christmas would come along or, or a holiday, what we would do is we would take, see a picture of us when we were performing, and we would send this out to our friends, and we would, we would put little captions, like, uh, what a Christmas, Terry, these guys love us. And, and then I'm saying, yeah, Jenny, they sure recognize talent. And then, and then she says, even with an out-of-tune 12-string guitar, a broken sound system, and baggy tights, they can't get enough of us. And then I would say, hope this is the last war American soldiers will ever have to fight. So, and then here we say, peace, it's still a good idea. Let's pray for our brave GIs. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year with love and blessings from your friends, Jenny and Terry. And we did it. Thank you. Here's another one that we did when we were 16 years old. See, we, we, we were performing at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital. And these are people from Vietnam. We had no idea that we would end up going to Vietnam and performing in person. So here we were performing, and we have wonderful letters from uh, relatives and people from, uh, from uh, this experience saying thank you so very, very much for coming and performing for us. But this is the Great Lakes Naval Hospital, 1966, a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Christmas wish, Terry? To somebody, someday be in who's who in the world and find a man who enjoys good accordion music. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we are actually, we were in the who's who of America, who's who of the world, who's who of uh, the West, who's who of um, women. Okay. <laughs> And then Jenny's response to that remark was, you're a dreamer <laughs> to find a man who likes accordion music. I still have one of our accordions. It somehow managed to stay with me all these years. You still play? No. <laughs> no. I know. No. I jokingly say, because we, we, were, we were made to take 10 years of accordion lessons from 6 to 16, so I tell people I think that's a form of child abuse. <laughs> Anyway, that's another story. Uh, though, although my father was very, he was wonderful. He really pushed us. As a matter of fact, he got us to do some double gum commercials by writing to Arthur Meyerhoff Advertising Agency in Chicago. And he, was a re he really pushed us uh, with our performing. And at the time, uh, you know, at times it was a, a little trying, but you know, it turned out to be the best thing that could possibly happen to us because we ended up doing all these exciting, wonderful things and, and being overachievers, I would say, uh, once we, once we you know, left home. May the new millennium, oh, this had to be in, in 1999, may the new millennium be filled with dreams coming true with love, Jenny and Terry Frankel. Um, you performed at hospitals and, and bases any time you got a chance, didn't you? Every chance we could. You're from six, actually from six to sixteen with the accordions, and then and then eighteen. Well, actually, you, yeah. I guess I guess there, until we were about, I would say twenty eight. Uh, we we did we performed uh, it, as many places uh, as we could. I, I know when we were in um, at the comedy store, we performed at Point Lagoon and uh, different places uh, uh, whenever we could. I'm sure there are people, there will be veterans who will recognize your name and uh, 
have seen you and appreciated that, mm -hmm. as do we. Thank you.